of the Mason Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 154, covering the week of January 21st through January 25th, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute and subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media buttons on our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. You'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday. Also, while you're at abbevilleinstitute.org, at the top of the page you'll see a button that says support. Click on that and you have donor options. If you'd like to help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, you can donate monthly or annually or give us a one-time gift. Uh, All of that is available on the website. You'll see all the information for that. We do appreciate every penny you throw our way. So um, these uh, contributions are also, these donations are also tax deductible to the full extent of the law. So uh, help us continue our mission at the Abbeville Institute. Also, you can get your Abbeville Institute apparel if you go to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, again, you'll see a button that says Shop, and then you have a link for our apparel. Click on that. It'll take you out. This is all embroidered material. It's great stuff. High-quality hats, shirts, fleece. It's now cold, so we've got these fleece uh, pullovers you can wear. Uh, in the south, we say it's cold if it's 45 degrees. I mean, that's, that's cold, right? So get your fleece, and you can go outside in 45 degrees. You'll feel good. So... Um, Get that Abbeville Institute uh, embroidered apparel. And one uh, reminder, we've got an interesting uh, online Jefferson seminar coming up January 29th. So uh, just a few days from now. Um, but January 29th, you go out to our Facebook page uh, or go to our Twitter account or go to, uh, well, actually those two pages where it's going to be held. The Facebook page primarily. Uh, but Brian McClanahan, myself, will be doing a... Uh, Jefferson Seminar on A.T. Bledsoe's Is Davis a Traitor? This will be a four-part seminar, 30 minutes each time or thereabouts. We're going to go over the book, cover it, and uh, why you should read that book. I mean, it's one of the most important books ever produced on the Constitution as a commentary on the Constitution and, of course, a session. So I'll be covering the book, Bledsoe himself, and we're going to go through it. If you've never read it, if you've got it sitting on your shelf and uh, you've got a you know a facsimile or something of, of the book, you never read it. It's a good time to read it. There's also it's free. It's in the public domain, so uh, you can go out and get that as well. Uh, just look up Bledsoe as Davis a traitor, and you'll find all kinds of versions of it online. Uh, so you can get that for free, and uh, that's a it's it'll be a fun time. It's open to the public, and you can comment. You can ask questions. It's gonna it's a new experiment we're trying, but uh, hopefully you'll participate in that. And um, it'll be a, a blast, I think. So January 29th, 8 p.m., just go to our Facebook page again. And uh, you don't have to sign up or anything. You can just show up at 8 p.m. Uh, and watch the seminar. Uh, it'll be, it'll be a, a real blast, I think. All right. Well, let's talk about the material for the week. Um, the, the theme of all of these pieces is reconciliation. And this is something that I think that we've been, we've been talking about a lot on the website. And hammering on this podcast and the the truce that was made between the North and the South at one point uh, when the war was over, that the South, for example, would recognize Abraham Lincoln as a great president, uh, that they would rec- they would say that they were wrong on on several accounts, that they would come back in and be good willing p- participants in the Union, and Northerners would then say Southerners were honorable people, their soldiers were American veterans. Uh, They should be respected. Southern heroes should be revered. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, these people should be revered. Uh, There was a period of time, of course, right after the war, but the feelings were fairly hot. I mean, these two sections were just shooting at each other. And there were people in the North that wanted the South punished, particularly the radical Republicans. You probably had a a slim minority of the Northern population that wanted the South punished, fearfully punished. But you did have the majority of the Northern population, I think, and, uh, of course, when you add in the South, that uh, was not in favor of that. So the majority of Americans, by the 1870s in particular, did not want the South punished. They saw in the Southern cause elements of, from the Northern mind, elements of the American tradition. Of course, Southerners talked about this all the time. Look, we're just fighting for the founding, founding principles. We're fighting for independence. 
So there was a period of time beginning in the 1870s, late 1860s, forward into about the 1960s, where the South was considered to be a valuable part of America. Now, it didn't mean there weren't attacks on the South. It didn't mean there weren't Northerners who would criticize the South and call it all kinds of names. One of the pieces we ran this week is very clear about that. Uh, and it was written in 1917. And if you read it, you could have written it in 2017 <laughs> because of the, the context. And I, that's why we published the piece, and it's, it's interesting in that particular way. But the theme of this week is certainly attacks on the South and this balance between reconciliation and punishment and where we've gotten to in 2019, where we are today, contrasting that with where we were just 100 years ago. And uh, less than that, I mean, where we were just 30 years ago. Um, 30 years ago in the 1980s, it wasn't seen as uh, offensive to have a Confederate flag on the top of a television car that was the most popular television show in America, the Dukes of Hazard. It was considered to be great to have a Confederate flag and to have the General Lee. I mean, this, this was the most popular television show in America. And you ask, you know, you hear Ben Jones talk about it. We had him at our conferences. He would say, you know, there are people, he, as, he, as he was a representative uh, from Atlanta District, uh, there would be uh, Black residents of Atlanta said, yeah, where's the General Lee? Let me see. They, they loved that car. They loved everything it was. And nowadays, you ride that thing out there and you you uh, you know play the little horn that plays Dixie. I mean, you'd be uh, considered to be the worst, the most vile creature on the face of the planet. The most offensive person out there. This is how far we've come in a very short period of time. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the indoctrination of universities and colleges, and how that's been translated out into social media and other things. And so it's the mob mentality. I mean, we, we see this now. Every, it seems like once a week there's some new outrage from somebody doing nothing uh, that's even offensive in one little bit, but you have uh, this mob mentality on the, on the Internet. And then, of course, that's, that's uh, compounded by the fact that all of these idiots that have this mob mentality on places like Twitter and Facebook and others have been indoctrinated at a public... Uh, uh, college or university, or even private college university, but more than likely uh, somewhere that's uh, uh, being taxpayer funded, and um, you have the great big mess we have today. Uh, th to show, though, that how, how stupid these people really are in social media, there's a, a libertarian uh, named Michael Malice who uh, circulated a, a uh, on, on purpose, he did this on purpose, um, on Twitter where he said that, uh, you know, Hitler, he, when, when people were talking about Trump building the wall, and he would say, he posted that, you know, Hitler built the Berlin Wall, so Trump is Hitler. And of course, we know Hitler didn't build the Berlin Wall. Uh, but he did this to be funny, and this thing has been picked up. Now, people actually believe this. It, it, there's, there, are, there are instances where people have gone out and said that this is true, and that is the power of social media. And so, um, this is what we're combating. The level of stupidity in America is well over 100%. I mean, it's, you, can't, you can't make up some of the idiotic things that people are doing nowadays that would have been unheard of just 30 years ago, but particularly 100 years ago. And in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, Americans, Americans thought that Confederate monuments, Confederate heroes were worthwhile and needed to be celebrated and cherished. Right about the time all these Confederate monuments were being built, you also had monuments to, to Union soldiers being built in the North, and Confederate, uh, former Confederate soldiers would go to those ceremonies because it was in the spirit of reconciliation. And we've talked about this a lot, and this is nothing new. One of the other things that's interesting, while these Confederate monuments were being built, you also had monuments being built to the uh, men who fought in the Spanish-American War. You had monuments being built to the men who served in World War I. Uh, that's <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, you know, for example, there was a monument built uh, right after the war in, in Virginia. Uh, it's Lady Liberty, and uh, it has on it, this is in Virginia, right about the time all these Confederate monuments being built too, you know, 50 years later, they're building this World War I monument. Not only do they put the uh, Virginians, they, they put all Virginians on there, white and black, who served uh, in World War I. It was built by the American Legion, but all, all Virginians from that town, from that community that served, they put them on that monument. Of course, these people are just racist. 
Right about the same time, they're also building Confederate monuments in Virginia as well. Um, so it's... You almost can't make up the stupidity of the one side in attacking Confederate monuments and uh, Southern symbols. But this is where we are. And so we started the, piece, started the week with a piece that uh, upset some people because they, well... They don't want to. They don't want to read anything that could be uh, that has part of it that they may not agree with. I mean, this is again even on our side at times we have people that are so that are very close-minded, uh, and if something in a piece they don't agree with, they they have to scrap everything else. But and understandably, there's a part of this particular piece that I personally don't agree with, but that's okay because the piece was published in the spirit of reconciliation to show that. Uh, just a little over 100 years ago, the President of the United States actually thought having a, a memorial or some type of remembrance for Robert E. Lee was a very good idea. Now imagine if Donald Trump wrote something like this today and the the blowback from that in America. But in 1907, and this was an honorable thing to do, this is Teddy Roosevelt, who I have criticized as being one of the worst presidents in American history. So the fact that uh, this piece was published, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, okay, yeah, he's um, not a great president. But he wrote in 1907, on January 16, 1907, in honor of Lee's birthday, um, a glowing, a glowing letter in support of Robert E. Lee. He wrote this to the um, uh, some of the professors and supporters of SWANEE, the University of the South. And he said, you know, what we need is a real memorial to Robert E. Lee in America, some place that all Americans know that will know and go to remember Lee as a great American, not just a great Southerner, but a great American, the of the finest American character. Now, you couldn't pull this off in 2019 if your life depended on it, if you were a major public figure. I mean, we can publish it on the Abbeville Institute all day, but you couldn't pull it off. If you're Donald Trump and you actually wrote this letter, uh, I'm pretty sure that the Congress would call for his impeachment at this. I mean, they're already doing that. But I'm pretty sure that they would start impeachment articles because he wrote a letter uh, in support of Robert E. Lee. This is how stupid Americans have gotten. Um, and he goes into Lee's history and, and the things that he did. And uh, But one of the, part, one of the parts of the, of the article that some people didn't like is where he was very complimentary of of the South and and coming into the to the North, um, and how that was good for the South to be part of the North. Uh, again, this is the spirit of reconciliation. You can look at the time and say, okay. I mean, at the time itself, I mean, people were saying, I mean, we need to be part of the Union again. Um, now we can look back on that and say, well, maybe they were mistaken because of what's happened with uh, with modern political correctness and other things. Uh, but at the time, I mean, there were a lot of Southerners who said, we, we, hey, we're good Americans. We just want to be accepted. We're going to go and, and joyfully fight uh, for the United States and the Spanish-American War. We're going to go out and do our duty and fight in World War I. And, of course, World War II. Uh, I was watching uh, the uh, Ken Burns documentary on the Vietnam War, and there was uh, an image uh, while they're going through. And, of course, you know, they, they intersperse you know, images from Vietnam. There's an image of a couple of guys firing off a mortar. And right in the background, you see a huge battle flag there in Vietnam. So Southerners were taking part in all of these things, and they were happy to be Americans, and they were happy to show that they're still Southern. That flag meant that they were still part of a, of a recognizable, regional part of America. And a valuable part of America. But no longer. No longer. So, to have Teddy Roosevelt write a letter in support of Lee is something that couldn't happen today. And generations of Americans grew up, particularly uh, generations who grew up in the 50s and 60s. That was about the last time you grew up thinking the South was a valuable part of America. But really, well, I mean, I could say maybe into the 80s. I mean, we had the General Lee. But uh, the television shows, the popular culture, it was all wrapped around this idea that the South was, was valuable. The Southern soldiers were honorable, heroic men that deserved our respect. Uh, Robert E. Lee was a great American. I point out in uh, my Politically Incorrect Guide to Real American Heroes how there's a, a calendar from 1940 in my parents' house. Uh, it's the year my father was born. But 
It's published by a, a northern insurance company. And um, on that calendar, you have, a, in January, you have Robert E. Lee birthday. Stonewall Jackson birthday. This is from a northern insurance company. And that was, now you get a calendar. It's got all these strange holidays from other countries, right? But in 1940, you had real American holidays. Robert E. Lee's birthday. <laughs> I mean, this is this is where we've gotten to. You you go and my you know my kids have calendars on the wall and they've got some. Uh, it's this holiday in New Zealand. Why? Why would you put that on an American calendar? Um, so, this is where we've gotten to. Uh, great Americans are not even put on American calendars anymore because of well, political correctness. Uh, so. Having a, 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 of course, we just had, you know, Lee's birthday and Jackson's birthday and it's Lee Jackson month. And so we thought it was appropriate to publish this piece and show that um, at one time, Americans didn't matter. They were North or South. They recognized Lee as a great American. The president of the United States could write a letter saying that Lee was a great American. And people loved this. Of course, Roosevelt's mother was, as he said, an unreconstructed Georgian. Um, so Roosevelt himself was uh, very sympathetic to the South. We can we can criticize his um, his presidency and the things that he did, and of course the problems that he helped create with the American executive. But uh, at least he still understood that Southerners were a valuable part of America and should be celebrated. People like Lee, in particular. And that said, you know, you go to the, to the piece on Tuesday, which is a book review of uh, by Paul Gottfried of uh, uh, Valerie Protopappas's uh, Thousand Points of Truth, which is about uh, John Singleton uh, Mosby. The Great Ghost. And he writes in the conclusion, this again gets into that, uh, he gets into that idea of um, a reconciliation. He writes that for those who are not old enough to remember, Mosby was once a widely revered 19th century American hero like David Crockett and Andrew Jackson. The Great Ghost was featured in a popular TV series in the 1950s. And young Americans like me grew up properly recognizing in Mosby a noble and manly epic figure. Of course, he was that and more. Mosby was also, like Lee, a figure who personified reconciliation in post-Civil War America and who illustrated the possibility that the victorious North and its defeated Southern fellow Americans could honor heroes on both sides of a tragic struggle. That America is now dead, destroyed by anti-fascist vandals, PC administrators, and would-be educators. In this new and less admirable America, Mrs. Protopappas' subject has no place of honor. And this is true. I mean, this is where we are in 2019. It's a sad commentary on what's happened. And he points out what it is. Anti-fascist vandals. Well, they're not really anti-fascists. They're, they're fascists. <laughs> That's what they are. I mean, let's, let's point out what the Antifa people really are. They're the, they're the real fascists. Um, and uh, the, the PC administrators will be educated. I mean, this is, as I just mentioned at the beginning of this, of this episode... That is the real problem in America. It's the it is the political politically correct colleges and universities that are pushing out this stuff. And why I mean one of the reasons why we exist at the institutes is to try to have the people that are actually you know rational, normal thinking people uh, have a place to go and express those views uh, that aren't outraged by everything. So uh, Dr. Gottfried is right on here. He's right on in what's happening with uh, where where we've come again. 50 years, 60 years later. Um, I'm going to go back go back around to the Calhoun piece that, uh, that Clyde Wilson wrote. Uh, but staying on this theme of, of reconciliation, the piece that I wrote on Thursday, uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a, an Alabama circuit judge uh, just uh, before he left office a couple of, about a little over a week ago. His term was up. He's leaving. He's retiring. So his last ruling was on a Confederate monument in Birmingham that's been under attack now for, uh, well, a little over, a, almost, well, working on a year and a half. Okay. Um, but really since 2015, this monument's been under attack. And that's because, of course, the city of Birmingham has decided that the monument is offensive. As uh, the judge says in the ruling, it's repulsive to the citizens of Birmingham. So they've tried to have it moved, taken down. They've tried to block it. Uh, they've tried to cover it. They've done all kinds of things. The mayor has, the city council. And, of course, in the state of Alabama, there's a Monument Protection Act. 
uh, that says you cannot alter or move anything that's over any monument over 40 years old. You can't do anything to it. These are, it covers all monuments. It doesn't matter if it's Confederate or not. It covers all monuments. If it's over 40 years old, uh, you can't do that. You can't alter the monument. So when the city of Birmingham put barricades around it so you couldn't read it and they covered it, the state sued. Said, you're going to pay us $25,000 a day for as long as these barricades and all this other stuff stays on top of the monument. Well, the city said, we're not, we're not going to pay the money. And so they hired uh, the SPLC and uh, got involved in, to defend them. And so this thing made it all the way through the lower levels of the Alabama uh, Circuit Court. It got there, and this judge sides with the city. And he sides with the city uh, based on a faulty understanding of the United States Constitution. Uh, because he says, number one, that this, this law violated uh, free speech and due process. Now, um, this is this. Who couldn't have expected this? I mean, this is this is a cautionary tale, as I titled the piece, a cautionary tale of monument protection laws. Those that are writing those le- that legislation now, because some of this is working through other states, need to be aware of the of how the other side is going to attack these laws. This is a opening. This is an opening salvo in these type of of legal efforts to get rid of these laws that are protecting these monuments. Because you can get rid of the laws that protect the monuments, well, then um, you can get rid of the monuments itself. Now, there's other ways to go about this. Of course, you can privatize these things. You can put these monuments on private property and other things. That's also an option, and I think people are looking at that. But a lot of these monuments are not, it's going to be impossible to do that. So uh, there's got to be some other way to pr- to protect them. And so the state of Alabama says, we're going to protect it with legislation. Now, the reason this, this decision is so faulty in understanding it, uh, what's happened in, in America is we've gotten federalism destroyed from both ends. We've had federalism destroyed from the top down, where uh, the general government believes it can do whatever it wants and the states can't stop it. And now we've got federalism destroyed from the bottom up, that the cities somehow have uh, extensive powers against the state. And they do so, in this judge's opinion, because cities are corporations, and as corporations, they're persons. This is corporate personhood. And he says that the 14th Amendment upholds this position. Now, if you go back and look at the original intent of the 14th Amendment, and it's, it's, a, it's a problematic amendment, uh, without question, um, and it wasn't even legally ratified. But when you go back and look at the 14th Amendment, uh, and you look at what the authors of the amendment and what the ratifiers of the amendment said, uh, there's there's no evidence that this amendment was intended to be interpreted the way it's been interpreted by the federal court system. That's one of the problems. Due process, an understanding of due process from an original position, is that you had procedural due process, meaning that as long as all the proper procedures were followed in court, your due process was sound. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that uh, governments can't pass legislation denying your life, liberty, or property. Of course they can. But, and as long as... If you were convicted of a law, as long as all the proper procedures were followed, you could be denied those things. This is what the founding generation, it's, it's procedural due process. Now, later on, in the 1850s, we get the codification of substantive due process, which means the, uh, the legislatures, whether they're the, of the general government or the state governments all, later on, couldn't pass any legislation that, that might prohibit property. So this was a different perspective on due process, uh, and this is the the this is the position that this court used, and what other courts have used now in in the twentieth century, to say that uh, you know a lot of the legislation is is unconstitutional because it's substantive due process. Now the case that made that happen, and I point this out in the piece, who would have known that the uh, SPLC and all these lefties would be siding with Southern slave owners? in uh, the case of Dred Scott v. Sanford. Who would have known that, right? Because this is what they're doing. This, is the fir- this, is, this case is vilified across, I mean, universally condemned. But this particular ruling relies on that understanding of due process. So they're siding with Southern slaveholders. I mean, they, these, these good progressives siding with Southern slaveholders in 1857. Uh, also, the f- idea of corporate personhood uh, it, they would they would believe then uh, John Roberts and the Citizen United case uh, that said that uh, yeah I mean corporations are persons and so they can they can contribute as much as they want to uh, to campaigns and other things it's free speech for corporations so here we have these progressives again 
I mean, I'm sure they don't like John Roberts. I mean, you see, the, oh, we got we got to block all these uh, Republican judges because they're not going to side with us. Well, of course they do. They, they agree with a lot of what you do. Uh, so we have these two faulty. And then, of course, the idea that free speech is somehow being uh, destroyed here because the city, a corporate person, cannot take down a monument. What about the people that support it, support the monument? I mean, their free speech is now being denied. Uh, and I make the point, it, nobody says you can't stand out in front of the monument with a bullhorn and signs and everything else and talk about how, as long as you're not dis disrupting the public, causing, inciting violence. Or, yeah, I mean, okay, so stand out there and say you don't like it. But the monument itself stands. And one of the things, we, as the state said, look, we have complete control of the municipalities in our state. We are sovereign. And I mentioned that, you know, the state of Alabama could just abolish the city of Birmingham, revoke its charter and say, all that property, do you say is city property? No, no, that's state property. You only hold it at the pleasure of the state, which is true. This is how it works. The, the record is clear that the states had complete control of their own property, which were the cities. The cities were incorporated by the states, and therefore the states could revoke those corporations. Um, and... The, the states were the agents of creation of both the cities and the general government, so they have all the power. But what this judge is saying is, no, you don't. You don't have power over these cities, not complete power. They have power. Well, I mean, we could talk about decentralization from the bottom up. It may not be a bad thing, but that's not the way the system works. That's not the way we, we have our federal system where the states have complete control of these things. So uh, it, it's I, I think that people need to understand the, the legal action that's going to be taken against these monuments and craft the legislation to combat this because um, if you're if you're trying to go that avenue well I mean the the judges both at the state and federal level have been uh, very effective in twisting the law to their position um, and <laughs> what needs to happen is this legislation needs to be written so well that even a judge can understand it as a uh, as I think Sam Irvin said that. He needs to be written so well, even a judge can understand it. Uh, so this is, the, I mean, this is the problem we have in America. So you've got the legal system now pushing back, saying these things are repulsive. I mean, rep come on, a monument. Uh, what is a monument, an inanimate object ever done to any of these people in the state of, of Alabama or the city of Birmingham? Nothing, nothing. And of course, at the time this thing was, was built, and this is all the spirit of reconciliation. There's nothing offensive on this monument or even this. This shouldn't be offensive to anybody. Uh, uh, Southern soldiers, Confederate soldiers have been recognized by the United States government as American veterans. So this is all just ridiculously stupid. But that's where we are. We're in stupid America. Now, uh, the piece on Friday written by Lang Gardner Tyler in 1917. So about uh, 10 years after the piece uh, by Teddy Roosevelt um, has to do with. He begins the piece talking about how he's, he's writing this in response to northern attacks on the South in 1917. So the reason that this piece was published is because, again, what goes around comes around. The South has been under attack from northern writers for a hundred years. For a hundred years. And what, he, what the, the charge was in 1917 is that somehow Germany was the South. So this idea that Nazis were Southerners, but, well, before that... Uh, which is completely stupid. Before that, then you had uh, that the Kaiser were Southerners. This, I mean, so the North was always pointing to the enemy, to the bad guys being Southerners. So they're always the bad guy, right? I mean, they're the Nazis. They're the Jap Japanese. They're the uh, they're the uh, uh, take your pick. I mean, they're they're whatever enemy we're fighting. They're they're, they're the the Germans in World War One. Whatever enemy we're fighting, uh, they are the South of the bad guys. They're just like those Southerners down there. And so Tyler, who, of course, was at William & Mary, writes this long uh, piece saying, no, no, this is just not true. And he goes in defending the South and criticizing Lincoln. It's a great piece. But the reason that it's there is because, again, this attack on the South and comparing the South to the enemy of the United States is something that's been done for 100 plus years. And I, I thought it was amazing here. You have, I mean, before Nazi Germany, the South was Germany. Now, then you have Nazi Germany, the South is Germany. So, I mean, this is, it's just stupid. I mean, all of this stuff is just downright stupid. But, and, and Tyler's saying, look, I, at the end of the piece, uh, it's, it's interesting, he says at the end of the piece, um, in conclusion, it's proper to state that it affords the writer no pleasure to indulge in recrimination. But as long as northern writers will insist on misstating facts and rubbing the old sores the wrong way, they need not expect absolute silence from the South. The North is to be congratulated upon its conversion to the principles for which the South contended, 
both in the revolution and the war between the states. The war with Germany, he said, should be pushed to a successful conclusion that the rights of small nations, the right of local self-government, the right of humanity, and the right of democracy be rendered safe for mankind. So he's, he's very supportive of Wilson the war, and we can talk about whether the, that was good for the United States, good for the South, or not. But he's pointing out that, uh, I mean, I think it's so funny. He says, well, thank you. The North is about time they've come and accept the South, the principles of the South. Uh, he's saying the South has supported these things from the beginning. The North is to be congratulated upon its conversion to the Southern principles. Uh, but if the North continues to attack the South, the South is not going to sit there and just take it. Southerners are going to respond. In this particular case, they did. He responded to this nasty attack on the South by Northern writers who were saying the South is Germany. Uh, so, again, reconciliation. Now, the last piece by, uh, by Clyde Wilson, this is an interesting piece for this, for this reason. Uh, and I, I don't have a lot of time, so I want to get into it very quickly. But there's this book, uh, there's a professor at Princeton University named, named Matthew Karp, and he's written a book recently criticizing Southern foreign policy for being aggressive, imperialistic, uh, that uh, the South was the, was the driving force in American imperialism. And he points to John C. Calhoun as being, uh, saying that John C. Calhoun was insincere. He wasn't genuine in his commitment to uh, being against foreign wars. And so this piece by Clyde Wilson, which was written before Karp published this book, it's an awful book, by the way, but I mean, he's, of course, Karp now is a major uh, you know, a hero among the left, and he's, a, he's an open socialist, um, a devout Marxist, uh, young guy, uh, you know, he, he goes around wearing his flannel shirts and he's got his uh, hipster beard. And, you know, this is this is Matt Carp. This is the young guy that's going to go out there and and be on the cutting edge. I mean, this stuff isn't on the cutting edge. Look, if you want to have a career, just pass the south. It's not you're not cutting edge when you do that. You're just following in line with all the other sheep in America. Uh, and, uh, you know, Kevin Goodsman wrote something on social media the other day. If you if you want to uh, make you make your way in, a, in the academy, you can't you can't do research on Robert E. Lee. Well, of course you can, as long as you support the. The uh, prior uh, reading the man position that Lee was a horrible guy, you can make your way in the academy. Or you support the, the phoner position on Reconstruction, you can make your way in the academy. You're, you're, you're following the, the allowable, the, as Tom Woods says, the 3 by 5 index card of allowable opinion. This is what you're doing. And this is what Matthew Carp doing. He's not, he's not on the cutting edge. He's not new and unique. He's simply regurgitating the slave power thesis of the 1840s. It's not new and unique. This stuff has been done. You want to be you, new and unique? Actually, go out and support Calhoun. I mean, these people are so stupid, they can't even get out of their own way to understand that what they're doing is actually just following the herd. But no, no, these people are cutting edge. They're cutting edge. So they're going to, I'm going to write this book on Calhoun and show how bad this guy actually was. And then he gets all the accolades. He's invited to speak everywhere. And, uh, you know, let's have, let's have Matt Carp come down and, uh, and talk about Calhoun, and we're really going to think seriously about Calhoun and uh, seriously about this idea that Calhoun was somehow anti-war, uh, and uh, we're, we're going to say that Calhoun was a bad guy, and that's going to be a cutting-edge academic position. You want a cutting-edge academic position? Go read this piece by Clive Wilson, who I think would know more about Calhoun than a little nimwit, dimwit uh, uh, Nimrod from, uh, from Princeton, Matthew Carp. I mean, considering he just edited the Calhoun papers for... Uh, his entire career, practically, uh, in the academy. So um, I, I think that uh, Cl I, I would listen to Clyde Wilson on John C. Calhoun over uh, Matthew Carp. But this piece gets into Calhoun's um, foreign policy, and it's a wonderful piece. Um, it's a wonderful piece, and it gets into, as he says, the title of the piece is uh, John C. Calhoun's Foreign Policy, A Wise and Masterly Inactivity. And he, he takes apart his war hawk position, all these other, uh, his position on the Mexican War, he gets into all that stuff. So this is a wonderful piece. Um, and it was originally published in our Eritor Journal, uh, which the Abbey Valencia had for a couple of years. Uh, we have all the material and all that will eventually again appear on our, on our website here. But you need to read this piece if you're interested in Calhoun in a real position on John C. Calhoun. Uh, forget about the Matthew Carp garbage. Uh, you can read that. You want to read that? Just go back and read some of the speeches from the 1840s and you get the entire, you know, this is the slave power. You get all that, the 1850s. You want, you want 
to read Matthew Carp, just go read the slave power stuff from the 1850s. And you got it. I mean, it's you don't have to read Matthew Carp for that. Read, read Clyde Wilson on John C. Calhoun. That would be better for you uh, than Matthew Carp. But again, this is in the, the hysteria that we're in today. Uh, you can't say anything positive about Calhoun because that, well, I mean, even saying something positive about Calhoun, are you serious? That guy, that guy was pro-slavery. It's the the arguments are so intellectually uh, not even they're anti-intellectual. I mean they're they're intellectually dishonest. They're anti-intellectual. Uh, but this is this is par for the course nowadays. So uh, I really like this piece. I really think that the the, the uh, material we published this week nicely fills in this reconstruction uh, reconciliation narrative. Um, and Americans need to know these things. And you can you can go after people with a chainsaw. Well, you can go after people with a scalpel at times, and sometimes you need to do one or the other. A lot of Americans need the scalpel. They need to see, well, I mean, if Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, this guy supported national parks. This guy was, I mean, he was he was progressive. If he liked Robert E. Lee, maybe it's okay to like Robert E. Lee. I mean, if he liked him, he's a normal American. I mean, we like Teddy Roosevelt. He's normal. Okay. He's on Mount Rushmore. Okay, well, you know, maybe it's okay to like Robert E. Lee then. This is the, that's the scalpel approach. That's the scalpel approach. Uh, the piece on Calhoun is the scalpel approach. Well, I mean, let's let's seriously talk about this. And then you have the Tyler piece, which is more of the chainsaw. Just go ahead and rip apart the, the North for being a bunch of morons. Um, so you you can go at both ends. You have to use all the tools in your arsenal to go after these people, and I think that's what we try to do as effectively as possible at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time. Good day.